on environmental degradation. I think this one, all it has is the one I have up here right now, which is the cost of corrosion. The corrosion engineers were thought leaders back in the 1970s, and they found that they did a study showing that it cost the United States $75 billion a year for replacing things that corroded. Of course, they're talking about replacing all the automobiles every 15 years, you know, bridges every 100 years, you know, uh, ships every 30 years, whatever, and you come up with a big number. Well, they went to Congress with this number and said, oh, you need to fund more corrosion research, and actually Congress did. And then all the, the welders and all the other people in different fields said, oh, well, the cost, you know, the, you know, the cost of bad welds is, you know, and Congress didn't buy it. You have to be the first one. Um, but in any case, there are studies, and the corrosion people still do them. I think this one is probably about the 1990s. And they actually broke it down by different sectors. The biggest sector for corrosion, and this is re replacement of things, is drinking water and sewer systems, 36 billion a year. Uh, motor vehicles, of course, is 23 billion a year, because cars rust out, okay? Uh, defense, which you should have some interest in, is about 20 billion a year, okay? 20 billion a year is a lot more than the budget of most of the militaries of anybody in the world, except us, because we're, what are we, about two-thirds of all, all the world's uh, military budget. Of course, China gets a little more money for their dollar. Um, there's also, since this is a uh, Navy course, there's a book on case histories and marine corrosion. I, uh, um, and I, I'm only handing it out because I found this in a book that was actually on my bookshelf. I didn't even know I had it. Um, um, illustrated case, case history of marine corrosion. And there's a paper in here that goes through forms of corrosion. Remember I told you there are eight forms of corrosion? It says there's a theory of marine corrosion. Well, the theory of marine corrosion is exactly the same as the theory of most other corrosion. Uh, it takes moisture, it takes oxygen, um, and it talks about cathode and anode areas and types of corrosion, uniform attack. Here's a, a galvanic series in here, which would be in some of the other books. To tell you a little bit about the galvanics, anybody know what the galvanic series is? I guess about the, the difference between metals and the farther apart they are, the more they're going to right. have a potential reaction. The voltage you can get between two metals. That voltage is a function of the free energy of formation of those materials. Okay? You can prove it from chemical thermodynamics. This is MIT, we go back to the fundamental principle, right? And so the, the most noble metal is actually not a metal, it's graphite, and then platinum, and they don't have gold on here. They list titanium, and I'm going to talk about why titanium is going down here later. The least noble, the one that wants to grow the, met, the most, has a negative 1.6 voltage. Platinum and graphite have a 0 .1, 0 0.2 voltage. The most corrosive is magnesium, okay? Uh, of the ones they've listed here. Actually, beryllium would be on here, but it's sort of a practical structural material plot. So I'll now tell you, anybody that, actually, you're a Navy diver, right? So, a couple of us. A couple of us, oh, wow. So, anybody been to Port Guanumi? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Port Guanumi, about 35 years ago, decided to get into the metal matrix composite business. And they, well, other people did too, but they were making graphite magnesium composites. Very lightweight, you know, like graphite's lightweight, magnesium's lightweight. These are interesting because if you try to polish, if you're making a sample and trying to polish it to look at the microstructure, if you did, if you polished it in water, it would be corroding in the polishing machine faster than you could polish it. <laughs> okay, because you got the biggest voltage difference. Okay, between those two. So they they started thinking, well, we do diving around here, and they came up with two applications for this magnesium graphite composite. One is they could wrap it in a plastic bag, and the diver could take it down and put a little rubber tent over whatever they wanted to salvage and then take this knife and pop the plastic bag and the thing would corrode so fast it would create a hydrogen bubble underneath this plastic bag and you could float it to the surface. 
with hydrogen. Just don't have any ignition sources once it gets to the center. Thank you. Well, they, you know, hey, uh, yeah. I'll bet you they probably used it a few times out there. Anyway, the hydrogen's not that bad. It's just a big poof. <laughs> uh, but the other was they could do the same thing. They put it in a plastic bag. They strap it with the diver's belt. And if he broke these things and it was in cold water, it would generate enough heat to keep him warm. Cheaper than a battery, right? So anyway, actually it's just a big battery. And in fact, um, we have batteries, um, uh, typical dry cell batteries, one and a half volts. It's graphite and, mag and manganese, which is not on here, but you get one and a half volts because man it's not magnesium, it's manganese, but anyway. Um, and it's not, these are all the galvanic potential for what we call the thermodynamic standard state. And not everything is at the standard state concentration. You can have things larger than the aqueous standard state. But typically, it's very difficult to get more than about one and a half volts out of the battery. Just think of your car battery, which is a lead acid battery, lead, lead sulfate battery, and you get about one and a half volts per cell. Okay? And then that's what people do. They find different chemical systems that will give you about one and a half volts. It's almost impossible to get a voltage of two volts in a simple single cell battery. By the same token, it only takes one or two volts to corrode something. If I want to do cathodic protection of steel, iron mild steel is right here, I need 0.85 volts to impress on that to keep it from corroding. So they build whole pipelines and they have in the areas where they have electrical, you know, AC electricity, they put in a rectifier, create DC electricity, put electrodes in the ground, and they actually make the whole pipeline 0.85 volts to a reference electrode, okay? And it will keep the thing from corroding for a hundred years, a thousand years, okay? And when, they, when they're in somewhere where they don't have electricity, I was out in West Texas where they're putting in some transmission towers, they use zincs, right? And if I go to this little, one of these little things, um, um, oh well, if I hand it out there, oh, it's right here. Oh, it's the one I'm looking at. Um, at the very back of this, they talk about marine corrosion and how they use zinc to be the sacrificial anode, and the sacrificial anode corrodes rather than the ship's hull. Or they put on a uh, electrical system that changes, they have an insoluble anode and insulation and everything else, but they they essentially are impressing electric current. That's what we do for nuclear submarines, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to maintain 0.85 volts. You can't go above 1.1 volts. Anybody know why you can't go above 1.1 volts? Because you now start turning seawater into hydrogen and oxygen. Remember doing that in high school? It wasn't seawater, but you took water and you electrolyzed it into pure hydrogen, pure oxygen. Uh, you can do that with magnesium and graphite because it's 1.8 volts. And that's more than 1.1, and you actually start generating hydrogen bubbles and oxygen bubbles. Okay? So, anyway. Um, so that's some corrosion protection, as far as that goes. Uh, that is. Um, okay. So, my notes. Okay. Now, um, so this is just a general handout on marine corrosion. If you didn't want to read anything else on the corrosion and just make your presentation, the, you could just read this, uh, this handout on illustrated case histories of marine corrosion. Okay? Uh, now, let's get to the thermodynamics. And there was a guy in Belgium after World War II, Marcel Corvée, and no one had any money to do research after World War II. They didn't even have any money to buy food because they didn't have any food. Okay, it's a pretty desperate time. 
But Forbay was a scientist at, in, uh, at a research lab in Belgium, and he decided he could do calculations. He didn't need equipment or things like that. He could just do some calculations. And he came up with this atlas of electrochemical equilibria in aqueous solution. Really catchy title. I kind of like my 50 years of MIT better. Uh, but, but anyway, he came up with a book where he calculated the thermodynamic stability of basically every element in the periodic table. Okay? So if you look at the beginning, in the, hand, in the table of contents, they got H2O, H hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, he's kind of going down the periodic table. And then second column, beryllium, magnesium, cap. So he grouped them sort of like the periodic table, and he's calculated everything. He even calculated PC. What's PC? Anybody know what PC is? On the periodic table? It's technetium. It doesn't exist on this earth in, in a radiator form, although you nuclear guys know that we use it for stress tests. I had a stress test once. They, they, Technetium, the reason it doesn't exist on this earth is the, the elements were formed in supernova, okay? When stars blow up, you take the hydrogen and helium and all that stuff and they make heavier elements. And the most stable element of all in the periodic table we have is something called iron. That's why there's a lot of iron in the universe. But technetium is formed and you can see it speculated in supernova but it, its longest half-life is about 10 hours, okay? So um, we actually form it in nuclear reactors by reacting it with you know, a bunch of neutrons hitting something else. Make technetium, one of the problems, there's a reactor in Canada and there's one in the United States that make technetium. And technetium is the silvery white metal. If you make it, make it it's not terrible. Well, it's not so radioactive that, that uh, uh, it's, extremely toxic, but they basically use um, jets to fly it around the country. And people are having a stress test, they basically do you as a living auto radiograph, okay? And they put you in a room that is gonna look at all the radiation coming through. And so they, they do this, the test and they take a picture of your heart pumping as you're stressing, you know, running on a treadmill or wherever. And they're taking this real time x-ray and then they come out and they inject you with some technetium, which is right underneath magnesium, ma manganese. And manganese is, you know, you don't need, manganese is non toxic. You actually, it's essential for health. So they give you a little radioactive technetium, and it's decaying rapidly enough that now they can see where the blood vessels are because the technetium is running through your blood. And if you have a blockage on your heart or something, they can see, oh, we saw something before, and we could see that. There was a blood vessel there, and now we see we don't see the blood vessel, which means blood's not flowing through there. So, um, so they use technetium uh, for that. I had a case once where a school burned down in Kentucky, and the, the people did an analysis in the scanning electron microscope, and they came up with an analysis that said there was 14% technetium in the nails, the roofing nails. And I thought, well, we can settle this case. We just sell the nails for the technetium, right? It just shows you how good some chemical analyses are. Uh, at least from that expert. In any case, I've given you, I should have given you a handout. Did I give, I just gave you the handout. On, uh, on the Forbay diagram, right? Did you get that? Yes. Okay, so we got the Forbay diagram here. Let's go over some of the stuff in the Forbay diagram in, in uh, Forbay's book. First of all, he has a chapter in the beginning about corrosion because corrosion is an electrochemical process. We have, and this is, you know, this is the whole, the whole chart, okay, on page 80 of Poor Bay's book. Um, now, I'm sure Poor Bay's passed away now, but the whole research center in Belgium is at several floors, the Poor Bay uh, laboratory. But he, he lists 43 of the elements in the periodic table in terms of their thermodynamic nobility and their practical nobility. And we've already talked about which one is best in terms of thermodynamic nobility in resistance to corrosion. And it's gold. And number two is iridium. Number three is platinum. That's why when I was a graduate student, I was about to get married, I 
made my electron beam melted, my wife's engagement ring, I bought the meridian metal one, and then machined it. Anyway, because I couldn't afford the gold. Actually, uh, that was the reason. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to have something um, that was a little different. And not everyone, of course, I also almost got electrocuted, but that's another story. Uh, it would have been a shorter way. Um, but it turns out there is also what they call the practical nobility. Thermodynamic nobility means it just doesn't want to form an oxide or a sulfide. Okay? It's not going to react with a lot of things, and gold is the best, iridium and platinum are near the, near the top. Uh, you can look at other things that you think of as somewhat, uh, you know, most of you don't even know rhodium and ruthenium and palladium, but those are platinum group metals. Mercury is oxidation resistant, silver. Mercury actually does react with sulfur very strongly. Silver is oxidation resistant. Osmium is another platinum group. Selenium is sort of a, a near metal it's, uh, underneath sulfur. And tellurium underneath selenium. Uh, polonium, which is only something you poison uh, officials in Ukraine with. Uh, or, don't you know that story? Yeah. You don't know that? That was, that was not that long ago. That one was only two or three years yeah. ago. Yeah, so. the, the, the leader of the Ukraine had some enemies, and some of those enemies had some good friends who used to be part of KGB, and so they got some radioactive pol polonium, which is very difficult to detect. And they were poisoning him slightly over time. And he was losing his hair and all these other things because he was radiation poisoning. But this is why he was the president of the Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, so that's KGB guys sneaky. Who's going to be analyzing for polonium? Okay, most people are getting fine on a fair table. But in terms of practical nobility, rhodium is better than gold. Niobium and tantalum are better than gold. Uh, so far, gold's number four. Iridium and five. So some of these things, sort of titanium's pretty good. Some of these things were way down here. Aluminum comes shooting up to number 19 from 39. But uh, magnesium shoots all the way up from 43 to 41. Uh, manganese, I told you they used uh, manganese in their batteries, graphite manganese. So manganese tends to grow pretty easily. Anyway, niobium and tantalum are 33 and 34. They shoot up to 2 and 3. Why are they so good? Well, it turns out these things have practical nobility because they form a protective oxide skin. So this is a very old I think I was an assistant professor when I got this one. This one has some sharp edges because they cut it, but it's a titanium pacemaker case. Okay, so you're going to carry a pacemaker in someone's chest. Titanium will not grow to the body. I told you that about the biggest voltage you can get is less than two volts. Actually, in an aqueous solution, titanium can take five volts. It won't pit, won't corrode. Okay, it's more stable with its oxide than just about anything else, unless you get rid of its oxide. We might talk about some of those things. But it's not easy to get rid of its oxide. Above 900 degrees um, uh, centigrade, I think. I have to check. It's 900 degrees. I can't remember. Sure how to say I'm pretty sure it's centigrade. Uh, it will dissolve its own oxide. And so they've had jet engine fires due to the titanium catching on fire. And at that point, you have a huge flare, only it's called your engine. And when it consumes itself, you don't go very fast anymore in that jet engine. I had a case where some guys that, uh, uh, in New York City just after 9-11 and another skyscraper, <laughs> they had a titanium heat exchanger. And you can grow titanium. In this case, they got some silt. They ran their, someone opened the wrong valve and they got all the East River silt into their heat exchanger which is a real problem. You get what we call under deposit corrosion attack. And titanium can corrode under some of those conditions, and it did. And so they had to replace this heat exchanger, so they hired some of these, you know, probably immigrants. They were actually immigrants, but couldn't speak English. Because they were probably the only ones that you could let them to tell them to do this, and they wouldn't ask questions. Um, and so they went in with oxycetylene torches. And you can flame cut titanium. You'll learn about that when you take my flames part of my world, of course, about how you can flame cut titanium. Lots of smoke, just lots of smoke. We were cutting, we were cutting it in the lab here uh, about 20, 25 or 30 years ago, and the secretary across the hall, where my secretary is now, 
I didn't have this office then. She, she complained to the MIT environmental people, and they came down and they uh, saw the smoke in the lab and said, what's going on here? And the technician said, well, I don't know. He said, what type of lab is it? He said, he says, I'm cutting titanium. He said, well, what kind of lab is this? He says, it's a welding lab. He said, well, what do they expect to come out of a welding lab? These were the old days, 35 years ago, when it's okay to have a little smoke in the hallway and stuff. Uh, it's not good power. Okay? The paint on the wall is titanium dioxide. Okay, so we just give you a little, a little titanium dioxide. Anyway, um, titanium forms a very protective oxide skin. Okay? Talon forms a very protective oxide skin. This is a talon too. The problem with talon is a little bit pricey. It costs about the same as silver. Okay. One of the world's largest talent producers is A.C. Stark, right over here in uh, Newton, Massachusetts. Right among all those homes and stuff. Well, when A.C. Stark built their, their factory over there, it was all rural. This is the late 1940s. It's now owned by Bayer Chemical, which is kind of number one or two with DuPont. It's the world's largest chemical company. But about half of all the world's talent is processed in that factory with all these little residential homes around it now, 60 years later, those homes, they don't like this, this uh, factory right in the middle of the midst. But that's where I got a, a talon tube from them. And they put it in heat exchangers. If you're going to use sulfuric acid, which is the most common uh, uh, organic, actually the most, well, it's probably second. The most or common inorganic acid is sulfuric acid, industrially. The most common organic acid is acetic acid. They make acetate sheet plastics out of anyway. Sulfuric acid is used for lots of things. All your gasoline uses sulfuric acid as a as a um, catalyst to absorb water of reaction when they break up the hydrocarbons and stuff into the or making it into octane from heavy hydrocarbons. Well, the only things that will not corrode in concentrated sulfuric acid are tannin or graphite. So they make great big heat exchangers and a talum or graphite, except you can't afford to make the whole thing out of talum, so you clad the talum on carbon steel and you make a clad material and you're only using talum when you need it. And you can use very thin talum because it just doesn't grow. You also use talum as implants in the brain, okay? Um, if you have a brain, brain plate, it's probably made out of someone you know, as a brain plate, it's probably made out of talum. Won't grow in the body because it has extremely high practical no nobility, as does titanium. So we make implants out of titanium. Get an artificial knee, artificial hip. You know, some of your grandparents or your parents may have them. Uh, they're usually made out of titanium because they won't grow in the body. What kind of welding is this? That's Pardon? Process. That's welding. That's gas comes from arc welding. Okay. So they take sheet, they roll it. They actually melt the whole thing in a great big electron beam furnace. Talon and niobium can be cold worked at room temperature, all the way down. You don't have to anneal them. They're just so soft <coughs> that you can just, I mean, you can anneal them, but they don't usually anneal them. You can start with an ingot this thick and you can roll it all the way down, maybe with one anneal in between, okay, to make a thin sheet like that, okay, and then weld it. So it's actually, they work very easily. They're kind of pricey. Okay, so there is. You can talk about thermodynamic knowability and practical knowability, and practical knowability is what really counts. But the problem with practical knowability, if you lose your protective oxide skin on some of these things that are the best, like titanium. I told you titanium, you can dissolve the you can dissolve its own oxide above 900 C. The other thing, early on they had some very serious explosions where titanium was being used when they first developed it uh, because it it had such good corrosion resistance and they had a problem with anhydrous ammonia. Okay, anhydrous ammonia is an oops, put myself oh yeah. Okay. In H3. Okay. If it has no moisture in it, like less than hundred parts per million moisture, the titanium will react to form. So it's titanium plus this reacts to form titanium nitride, which is very stable, plus titanium hydride, which is very stable. And there's 
some X's and Y's and Z's in here to balance the equation, right? But so titanium will react with uh, anhydrous ammonia and cause stress corrosion cracking, and they had some really exciting explosions. Uh, they were using some of this with some of the rocket programs early on, blow up some of the launch pads and things. Okay. So there's practical nobility and thermodynamic nobility. If you go to Porbet's diagrams, let's look at the Porbet diagrams. Okay, this is a Porbet diagram, if you have a copy of this, for um, water. And this is really, well, it's a, a diagram of the potential in volts. Minus 1.6 is where magnesium would be, and plus, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is not really big out here. It sort of is. It's volts. Let's just call it volts. E in volts. Electro, uh, electromagnetic. It's not the field, it's the voltage. Why do they call it E? I guess they call it E. Anyway. Um, they're Europeans. Okay, we're guys. Um, so it's V in volts, and it's pH down here. So 7 is neutral pH, and A and B, A is the line at that voltage and that pH, you will form hydrogen at the cathode. And here, you will form oxygen. So as you change the voltage, this is your this is cathodic down here. This is a, a nodic up, up here. Down here, you have hydrogen ion stable. Up here, you'll form hydrogen peroxide in your aqueous solution. Okay. If I come over here, he's plotted it. Of the gaseous substances, you have oxygen up here. You have hydrogen down here. This is kind of the average where your water is. <coughs> you can have uh, ozone way up here. This is thermodynamic stability down here at the cathode. Uh, up here, you're going to have to form some oxide skin for something to be protective in the water environment. If you're worried about nuclear reactors, the only place where water is stable is between these two bold lines. Okay? You're going to be actually forming gaseous species uh, when you're above or below, either hydrogen or oxygen. So the same type of plot you can Think of liberation of oxygen and you acidify the water, liberation of hydrogen and you turn it into a caustic type of water, OH, okay? The hydrogen that you release up here combines with an H2O to form a hydroxyl radical. <coughs> Here's thermodynamically stable water. And here you can have oxidizing and acidic, oxidizing and alkaline, and similar things down here. So, if you want to dissolve gold, what do you dissolve gold in? What type of water do you dissolve gold in? The alchemists called it, named it. Aqua Regia. Anybody ever heard of Aqua Regia? The king of the waters. It's a mixture of nitric acid and uh, hydrochloric acid, either three to one or one to one. It's oxidizing and acidic. Very acidic, it's the concentrated acid. And it's got high chloride contact. Gold chloride is very slightly stable. Okay. In fact, I used to work for a gold company down south of here in Attleboro, where they make most of the jewelry and gold jewelry in the United States. And um, used to get some really good stories about people trying to steal gold. Okay. Uh, uh, they had a. The, the company I was working for was called Leach and Garner, and they had built a plant in 1899. And all the other jewelry manufacturers that you might have heard of, I can't think of their names now, but Leaches and Clus, and, uh, Swank, okay, um, and things, <coughs> built up around here because Leach and Garner was the mill. They would take gold bullion and they would melt it. They had two continuous casters for making gold alloys. And so they would just continuously cast strips of gold. Um, and then they would make it into everything you could think of. Tubes, sheet, foil, um, bar, wire. And they'd sell it to the jewelry people who would take the wire and make it into eyeglass light frames or something like that, or whatever they were make it out of. And um, so you had people, and they'd also take some of that alloy and they would they would grain it, they call it graining it, and they would 
spray it into a bath of water and you get these little pebbles and you then sell this to the people who are making your class rings or whatever and they would take that alloy, they would melt it and make the rings. So right through the middle of town in Alvor, there's a little stream and one of the um, companies was finding they were missing some of the gold rings and they found that people were throwing them out the window into the river and then on the weekend they go diving for the rings. So the solution was to purchase the mineral rights to the river, to the stream, from the town, and that way they could prosecute the people for stealing their gold because they purchased the mineral rights. But then they had a problem because uh, they caught one guy trying to steal, and they fired him, and um, they were still missing some, some of the rings. Turns out his girlfriend was still working, and she was just flushing them down the toilet just to spite the company. Okay. Uh, but the, my favorite story comes out of South Africa, because I got out to go all right. One guy was working in one of the gold mines in South Africa in one of the chem labs, and he would bring in um, uh, a hard-boiled egg with his lunch, and a little salt shaker with salt for lunch. But when he went home, he actually disposed of the salt, and he filled it up with gold chloride, which is a white salt that looks like salt. Okay, like sodium chloride. And so he was carrying out about an ounce of gold. <laughs> he has a gold floor, I think. So <clears throat> there's people who are ingenious and how they steal gold, uh, nonetheless. Uh, oxidizing and acidic will dissolve gold. Uh, reducing, uh, very reducing, is like using the ammonia, where you have no oxygen potential. You've got rid of all the H2O and you're way down here, and you can dissolve away the titanium dioxide, no longer have the practical ability, and things still will, okay? With a very rapid reaction, okay? So, you can look at other things. This is in the corrosion area of four phase diagram, and he has beryllium. Beryllium is in neutral waters uh, between, let's say, three and a half and uh, ten and a half. Beryllium is stable. It will it can be uh, acidic or caustic solutions will eat it away. Uh, aluminum is similar, okay? Uh, and so aluminum, as long as you don't get too acidic or too caustic, you actually clean aluminum in, uh, in industrially by using caustic solutions usually. You can use it with acidic solutions, but it's usually hydrogen fluoride, which is sort of nasty all by itself. So you usually use caustic solutions for cleaning aluminum. We get down here, and here's silver. Silver has very good resistance to so lots of oxides and bases. Uh, here's gold, stable everywhere, which we know. Titanium has practical stability. Zirconium, what's our major use? The only, well, there's only two uses that I know of of structural zirconium. The nuclear guys, what's? Pulse fuel rods. It's the cladding of fuel rods. So you put your uranium oxide or plutonium oxide, whatever it is, for fuel, inside a zirconium tube. Why do you use a zirconium tube? What do you bring by zirconium tube? Anyway, because what's the nuclear process section of zirconium? It's one of the lowest. Neutrons, it's transparent to neutrons. Okay, you want to absorb neutrons. So if neutrons are coming out of the fuel, you want to when we get out and do their work and then catch them in the borate the water or whatever you have, however you design this reactor. And why do you use boron? Boron is the exact opposite. It absorbs neutrons better than anything else. So you use borated water. Just put borax in water and you can stop that whole nuclear reactor from reacting. Okay? Zirconium is one of the few things that, but the zirconium has to be very pure and almost no hafnium. Hafnium and zirconium are right above each other on the periodic table. And hafnium has a fairly high neutron absorption. And so you have to have very, very zirconium or hafnium free zirconium. The other use of zirconium, it's for making acetic acid. I told you that tannins what we use uh, the best material for making sulfuric you or containing sulfuric acid. Essentially if you're making acetic acid they make reactors out of zirconium. So if you want to learn how to weld a titanium submarine, titanium and zirconium are right 
above and below each other in the period, chemical periodic table. And so the people down in Texas City, Texas, where they make huge acetic acid plant, they build zirconium reactors to contain their, their to make their acetic acid. If you go over to China, they've also learned how to build their own zirconium reactors. That's another story we can get into sometime about how the British tried to fool the Chinese and the Chinese snuffered them okay, uh, by developing better technology. So here's some more practical um, elements. Here's titanium. I thought we'd done that before. But anyway, chromium. Chromium is the basis of stainless steels. And you can see that chromium has a fairly wide range. It'll go to very caustic solutions. It doesn't like acidic solutions. And later, I will probably show you a plot of chromium with chlorine. And you see this band just shrinks down to nothing. So that's why stainless steel doesn't always do well in salt water, as far as that goes. Tin is fairly stable. Iron. Iron is the Achilles, one of the Achilles heel of iron is its uh, susceptibility to corrosion. Uh, uh, lead is actually can be fairly corrosion resistant. Anyway, silver, copper, yeah. anyway. Um, so Corvey can tell you the thermodynamics of corrosion, um, but what we really want to know in most cases is the kinetics of corrosion. Now Corvey developed his atlas for aqueous corrosion, okay, wet. So things where in the world we live where we have water. But at Corvée's research center, which is now called Sepulcor, the Belgian Center for Corrosion Study, uh, they've also worked on, oops, let me show you that next time, an atlas of chemical and electrochemical equilibrium in the presence of a gaseous phase rather than, rather than aqueous phase. So here we got good old simple core. Um, and in here, because it's more recent, they have nice color pictures in some cases. Uh, color diagrams. But anyway, it's a similar type of diagrams, but here we have hydrogen chloride. Okay? So this.